Amen, amen. I believe these ladies are hitched in, don't you? Amen. Amen. All right, just making sure you're getting something out of that just like I was. Hallelujah. Well, we've about lost our voice this morning already, but uh, we pray that we'll have enough to, to have something to say today. I do uh, have two things I want to mention. Number one, um, I want us to wish a happy birthday to one of our faithful, faithful online viewers. Uh, we have Mrs. Lois Huffman, who watches us every Sunday morning and Wednesday night all the way from Ohio, and Miss Lois will be 81 on Tuesday, but she's very faithful, never misses a service. So if you're going to pray for 81-year-old Mrs. Huffman on, for her birthday, that the Lord would bless her in this coming year, let's just give a round of applause or a hallelujah and just let her know. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Lois, we appreciate your faithfulness. We know you're watching this very hour. Also, we have a first-time visitor this morning that we would uh, like to recognize. Their very first time uh, here at Liberty Baptist Church. We're so, so excited. And I can already tell you, uh, this is definitely my favorite member of all of you, uh, Miss Amelia Bennett. Cody, just don't take her out of the car. Don't wake her up. Just lift the car seat up or whatever you, you have to. There we go, right there. Amen. Sam and Cody's. Amen. They, uh, they love me so much, they named that little girl Amelia David Bennett. So we're, we're so thankful for that. What a unique name for, for a precious little girl. All right. If you will, turn in your Bibles to the book of uh, Isaiah, uh, Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah uh, chapter 5. It is good to be here, and we're so, so thankful. And listen, we believe this. We believe God sent you here for a reason today and for a purpose. We always believe that. But we believe the Lord sent you here not to be a spectator to the songs that were sung or a spectator to the preaching hour. Uh, but we believe the Lord sent you here because in that singing, he had a word for you from his word. Because that's what they sing is the word of God. Uh, and so we believe God had a word for you. So I hope you weren't so wrapped up on, in being entertained or uh, just uh, sitting there as an observer uh, watching what was taking place. Uh, but uh, we pray that you are taking each of those words personally because God had a message for you in what has been sung. And he's got a word for you in what I'm going to say today. So you just pray the Lord will enable us uh, as we stand here this morning. Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5. And stand with us in reverence and honor to the reading of God's word. I want to encourage you uh, while our folks are standing that if you're watching on Liberty Live and you have an opportunity to come worship with us if you're ever in this area, please do come worship with us. Visit, it, visit with us here at Liberty. I think you will find that uh, indeed where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Uh, we have a good time uh, in Jesus while we're here. Uh, we're thankful for his presence uh, and we're so thankful uh, that you're watching. But if you're able to come, come. Uh, we'd love to have you worship with us. So I want you to think on this thought. It's been years and years since I visited this text, but it's really been on my mind for several weeks now. But I want you to think on this thought, the tragedy of unfruitful living. The tragedy of unfruitful living. And that's, this is in Isaiah 5. And this is what Isaiah says. Now will I sing to my beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard, concerning his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. Uh, and so this is a place where this vineyard owner uh, knows that, uh, that fruit can be brought out of the ground. Good fruit, the best fruit, a very fruitful hill. Verse 2, and he fenced it and gathered out of the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. You may be seated, and may God add the blessings to the reading uh, of his word. Actually, at least go back to that, yeah, verse 3. I missed verse 3 some way there. Um, and uh, now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, between me and my vineyard. This is the Lord now talking. What more, now watch verse 4, and probably underline it in your Bible. What, excuse me, what could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? 
Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. And may God add the blessings to the reading of his word, the tragedy uh, of unfruitful living. So uh, to begin with, there in verse 1, uh, what I want you to notice is, uh, is that, little, that little phrase uh, that the Lord... Let me back up, I guess I should say. So this passage is talking about a, uh, uh, a vineyard owner. He goes out and he buys this vineyard. Uh, it is a piece of ground that he knows has the potential uh, to be a very fruitful place. And so what you need to make note of uh, in, uh, concerning the purchase of this land, this property, uh, is the potential that it has. Now watch this. Stay with me and watch this. Uh, and so the vineyard owner is the Lord. Uh, the vineyard that has been purchased is a picture of you and I as God's people. Uh, see, we've been purchased, the Bible says. We've been bought with a price as we prayed a while ago. And that price is the precious blood of the Lamb, the precious blood of Jesus. And so uh, we've been purchased, we've been bought, and here's what the Lord does and what the Lord knows. He saves us, and when he saves us and makes us his, he packs into us all of the potential that we could ever have to do something great for God. So I don't care. Listen, and, 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 uh, and, and this is the thought that's been preached many times, but uh, God doesn't call the qualified, but he qualifies the called. And if God has saved you, it, I don't care what your education is, your education level. I don't care how high you've ever made it up a career ladder. Uh, I don't care uh, what your talents are or your abilities are or your lack of education or your lack of a career ladder or your lack of training or your lack of schooling uh, or your lack of talents or your lack of abilities. None of that matters to God because what God has done, no matter who you are, is when God saves saved you, he packed inside of you all of the potential that you could ever possibly ever need and use to serve him for his glory. Are you with me right there? Okay, nobody's with me. Well, just close your Bibles and put your offering in the buckets as you go out the, the foyer there. So God has saved you and he's given you potential. Okay, now watch what I'm getting at. One of the greatest preachers I know uh, he, he's long dead and gone now. But he loved to preach, and I think Todd and I were talking about this the other day. Uh, he loved to preach about potential, potential, potential. And that's what he tried to put in our hearts and instill in our hearts and in our lives is that we have potential. And here's what he even said. He said he believed that one day uh, that we'll stand before God uh, and God's going to show us that from the time we were born until God called us home, that we went from point A to point B. This is what we did. This is what we accomplished. And then sadly, God's going to show us where we could have went with the potential that God gave us. But we failed to do so. And so what I'm trying to get you to see before we move on through this text is that God has packed inside of you potential. And what that means is, is we have no excuse. We have no excuse. And see, the thing is, the Bible says this, uh, that this place was in a very fruitful hill. It was packed full of potential. In other words, let me say it like this, this fruitful place that had been bought it could have easily brought the best. That's what it could have easily done. Uh, and, and, so, uh, and so what uh, this old preacher was telling us was that he believes God may show us this is where you come to in your life before I called you home. This is where you could have went and done things for me if you had, if you had given me my best all along, give me your best all along the way. The tragedy of unfruitful living. Truth of the matter is, we could probably stop right here and I could ask you just that question. Have you been giving God your best? Period. Question mark, period. Are you giving God your best this morning? When you got up and made your way to the house of the Lord? Did you give God your best? As these ladies stung on this, I stood on this stage and sing. Saying, I get my tongue straight somewhere. My, my, my tongue is not giving the best. I can promise you that right now. 
Have you been giving God your best? Those watching online, have you give God your best? Because watch what the Bible says God did. God bought this vineyard. It's got a lot of potential. The, so much potential that it can easily bring forth the best. Now, and I've said this before about being faithful to the Lord, but I've said this before, it's not meant for everyone to pick up an instrument over here uh, and, and to play something. It's not meant for everyone to grab a microphone and to sing something. It's not meant for everyone to get a microphone and be standing in the spotlight or, or on the, the, the uh, uh, Liberty Live on the, the World Wide Web uh, this morning. It's not meant for everybody. It's not meant for everybody and not everybody can pick up and go to a distant mission field uh, and live for three and four years there in the, in, in the back of Africa somewhere. That's not meant for it. But what everybody can do regardless of who you are, where you've come from, your circumstance, your situation, your education, your training, your skills, or lack thereof, your abilities, your lack thereof. It doesn't matter who, where, when, or what. What every one of us in this church can do today is we could give God our best. Amen? And so what the Lord does here, he says this. He, he bought this, he bought us. Okay? And then the Bible says this, and then he fenced us. He fenced it. And why do you fence a vineyard? Well, you keep all the wild animals out. You fence it to protect it. And we just said that this morning. We spoke at a men's prayer breakfast. And we just mentioned that out of the book of Job where, remember, uh, the, the, the Satan come before the Lord one day and the Lord said, Satan, where you been? And Satan says, uh, see, roaming to and fro, uh, fro and all the earth seeking whom I may devour. And, and the Lord says, well, have you considered my servant Job? Uh, and uh, as, the, uh, as the Lord says that, then Satan says, well, how can I? You've built a hedge around him. And see, how did Satan know there was a hedge around Job unless he'd got caught up in that hedge trying to get to Job at some point in time? And he had. And so what God does is he saves us. And he makes us his, and we belong to him, and he owns us. I'm pulling to the right this morning because some folks to the right need it worse than others, but I'll pull over here to the left a little bit because you folks uh, look like you need it too. And so he saves us, makes us his, and then what he does is he surrounds us with his, his protection, with a hedge of protection. Why? Because we belong to him, and he owns us, and so he's going to care for us. He's going to protect us. He's going to keep us from what might be and what could be uh, if the enemy had his way with us. The enemy can't touch us unless he goes through the Lord first. And so he's fenced us in. He's protected us. Now watch what happens. And then he gets all the stones out of that fruitful piece of property. Boy, I don't know about you, but before I got saved, I was, I was hard-hearted in many ways. I realize some of you, you were as kind as you can be and pleasant as you can be when God saved you. You may have got saved right out of church. You might have got saved as a little child, but that wasn't me. And I was, I was hard-hearted in many ways because life will make you cynical and life will make you hard-hearted at times. Uh, and, but I remember the day God saved me, how he took my heart of stone and he took your heart of stone and he made it a heart of flesh where we can feel and where we can love him and where we can serve him. And so he took all the stones out. Aren't you glad that God set you free from all the stones that was in your life? And then the Bible says this, and then he planted it with the choicest vine. In other words, God put the ability for the best inside of this vineyard to be brought forth. That's what God did with our lives. He put inside of us the ability to bring forth the best for his glory. And then he built a tower in the midst thereof. And, and also he made a wine press in the middle of this vineyard. And so that tower, that takes us back to the book of Habakkuk where we see another tower. And in this tower, this is where Habakkuk says, I'm going to get up every morning. I'm going to get up really early. And I'm going to make my way up into the watchtower. And there I'm going to sit and I'm going to wait and I'm going to wait and I'm going to see what the Lord has to say to me. I'm going to wait for the vision that he has given me. And so what God does, are you with me? And so what God does is God saves us. He makes us his. He surrounds us with a holy hedge of protection. He gives us the ability to bring forth the best. Uh, and then God gives us a vision for our life. 
life? Man, I mean, aren't you thankful that God has given you a vision for your tomorrows, that God has spoke to you about the goodness of the Lord, that God has spoke to you about what he's going to do and what he's about to do, that God has given you promises upon promises? That's a word from him. That's the vision of the Lord. And then that wine press, that's symbolic of the sweet spirit in our lives. Aren't you thankful for God's Holy Spirit? Those times when you're riding down the road and, man, maybe a certain song is on and you just know that the Spirit is all over that song and He's all inside your vehicle uh, and he's just, uh, he's just moving in your life. Aren't you thankful for those times in your life when you're in the grocery store line and all of a sudden the Spirit just prompts you? Maybe just reminds you that you belong to him. Maybe just reminds you that everything's going to be all right, child. Maybe just reminds you, hey, I'm going to take care of you. You're not going to have a need or a want that I won't meet or fulfill because I am your supplier. Aren't you thankful for God's spirit that you feel? Thankful for God's spirit that convicted me, that brought me to salvation, that assures me of his presence and his promises in my life. And so that's the spirit. So God's done all of that. I could preach and preach on on so much of that. And so he buys this piece of land. He hedges it in and protects it. And after he does that, he gets the stones out of it, all of the hard things out of it, gives it the ability to bring forth the best, Uh, and and then he gives it a vision uh, and, 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 and builds that watchtower. That's the vision he gives us. Um, uh, and then that wine press, that's the sweet spirit that moves in our lives. And so he did all of that. And so that's God's investment. Listen to me. What God has done in your life is God has invested his graces and his mercies into your life. Everyone sitting here, you have been invested in by an almighty God. I'm thankful along the way, both in my military service and in law enforcement. Well, God's done this my whole life, and in law enforcement and then in ministry. God has taken some of the best in all of those areas. Older people, older men who knew the stuff, and God has allowed them to invest in my life. Uh, And and so they have invested in me and invested in me. And I have been invested in by the best. And it's helped shape me and mold me and make me what I am today. But listen, one greater than my peers and my mentors has invested in me and invested in you. God himself has took a personal interest in our lives. And he's invested in you. God has done so much. He has done more than we could ever ask for. Are you with me this morning? Say amen. Okay. Let, at least uh, put up the next few verses there. And here's what the Lord then says about that vineyard. Because that vineyard, he says, it brought forth wild grapes. Or this, grapes that weren't any good. Grapes that weren't the best. Watch this. And so he's, he's talking to... to uh, to, to his people, he said, oh, inhabitants of Jerusalem, men of Judah, I, I pray between you, me and you, basically, what could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Now, imagine what the Lord's done. He's looking at this vineyard. Now, now listen to me and hear me out. He's looking at this vineyard, this, this piece of property that he bought, He's invested in it and invested in it and invested in it. He's give and he's give and he's give and he's equipped and he's equipped and he's equipped. And he's given it the ability to bring forth the best. And he sits back then. We see God's investment. But now we see God's expectation. And then God sits back then and he watches and he waits and he watches and he waits and he watches and he waits. And it only brings forth fruit that's less, much less much less than the best. In fact, fruit that's really not even good at all. And now God says this, could be the saddest verse in all the Bible. The Lord says this, what more could I have done? What more could I have done? Sometimes I think the Lord's like that with his church and his people still this day. He looks at us, he looks around He blesses us. 
He favors us. He graces us. I mean, look where God's give you to live. Look what you drove up in in this parking lot. You're sitting there with a stomach that's not growling because you haven't eaten in three weeks. God fed you. He's provided for you. Many of your needs this week you never even ask for. You never even ask for, but God invested in you and give to you freely without you even asking. I wonder sometimes if he looks at the church today and he wonders the same thing. I'm investing, I've invested, I've invested, I've invested. Now I'm going to sit back and I'm going to watch and I'm going to watch and I'm going to wait and I'm going to wait and see if it brings forth the best. And, God, and, he, and he looks and what he sees is not the best. Is not the best. Not in my life and not in yours many times. God's investment, God's expectation or God's disappointment we should say and he asked that question, what more could I have done? What more could I have done? At least the, the last verse. That is the last verse. I'm sorry, Elise. I missed the verse. Let me read that last verse. Verse 5. Sorry, Elise. Can you get that up there? How long will that take you? I'm going to put her on the spot. She's iced her thumb all week this week from having to take that joystick and chase us around uh, last Sunday morning as we heard your testimonies. I'll read it right from the Bible. And so now let's look what happens after the Lord is watching. Now go to and I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof and it shall be eaten up and break down the walls thereof and it shall be trodden down. And I will lay it waste, and it shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns, and will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. Oh, my goodness. Listen, what has happened right here. Now, listen, listen. I'm going to close very quickly. And, and girls, one or both of you can come to the piano, either play or play and sing whatever you want. But listen. And so there's God's investment. And, and, and then there's... There's God's expectation or God's disappointment because the Lord says, what more could I have done? And then there's God's judgment. And so God says this. God says, okay, here's what I'll do. I planted in this vineyard. Uh, I, I planted so that it, it, this vineyard, and I did everything I could do. I hedged it in. I took out the rocks. I gave it the choices. And I did everything I could do, everything I could possibly do to make it bring forth the best and then I give it time, and then I give it time, and then I give it time. Let me ask you this. How many of you, and those watching on Liberty Live, how many of you are waiting on a better, more opportune time to fully commit yourself to the Lord? A more convenient time to start doing your best for Jesus. I wonder how many of you are waiting. Well, I'm going to be honest with you, and my struggle is what every pastor struggle is through this COVID thing. Pastoring through COVID has been one of the most difficult, one of the most difficult things because there's no right decision. If a pastor does this, it's wrong. If he does that, it's wrong. Some want it this way, some want it that way, some think this, some think that, because there's so many different varied, uh, varied views of COVID uh, and, and how a church should operate or how things operate uh, in the public uh, or should operate in public. But listen to me. COVID was one of the, one of the diff, most difficult things myself and any other pastor have passed through. Because one of the things that's happened is, is we've watched people leave the church and stay at home to watch online. And, and now, and online's wonderful because there's people like Miss Lois Huffman who can't, she can't get out and make it to her local church. Or we're sick, we got a stomach bug, whatever the case may be, we're at home or we're on vacation. By all means, I believe in vacations. It wouldn't hurt some of you to take one or two more each year if you would, please. <laughs> Myself included. It'd make me more tolerable. By all means, the internet is wonderful. But the fact of the matter is, is we've compromised on some things, and, and being faithful to the Lord is one of them. Being faithful to the Lord's church is one of them. We sit at home and we watch online when we're able to come. Online's great if you can't come, but we sit at home and watch on when we're able. We'll be on the mall on Friday night. 
and we'll be on the, the sports field or the sports arena, wherever it may be, the court, the field, the diamond, three days a week, faithfully, faithfully. But when it comes to serving the Lord, he just don't get our best. And if we're going to compromise on anything, guess what we compromise on? We'll never compromise on our job. We won't show, we won't show up late. And if we have to stay over, we'll stay over. And we'll just do it. We'll never compromise when it comes to our hobbies or our activities. You know, when it comes to deer hunting or fishing, I've never sat there and thought, you know what? I've had a hard week. I just don't feel like I'll go today. I think I'll just stay at home. No, I've never compromised on that. But when it comes to being faithful to the Lord, we'll compromise there first. If we're going to quit serving, we'll compromise on the Lord's side of the things instead of worldly things. If we're going to quit coming, we'll compromise on the Lord's side of things instead of on worldly events. See, somewhere along the way, We've just quit giving God our best. And I want to tell you something. There is God's judgment here. We see God's judgment. Where God says, okay, you want to do that? And I'll just take my hand off of you. More vividly, I want to tell you where I think we first saw it at as a nation. I believe America's been judging, I believe God has been judging America for a long, long time. In many different ways. But I believe the first place it really becomes visible for someone who's spiritually slow like me was 9-11, 2001. First time since 1941 that a foreign enemy set foot on our soil and killed thousands. The first time in generations. You know what I think happened that day? I think God said, oh yeah, you want what you want, America? I'll let you have what you want, but I'll take my hand off of you. I'll let the hedge down. I'll let the enemy come in. So we see God's judgment in Isaiah 5. How God could come in if we're going to compromise on giving him our best. Yeah, God could take his hand off of you. He could take his hand off of your children. He could let the enemy come in. All of the things he's talking about right here. He's going to let the briars come up and the weeds come up in your life where there was once blessing and favor. But we compromise. We cheat God and we don't give God our best. And God's going to let all that happen. Yes, that's a serious thing right there. And years ago, I might have focused on God's judgment in Isaiah 5. That folks, listen, you better listen up because God's going to judge when we don't give him our best. That's not my focus today. My focus today is on God's disappointment. Where, where he says, look what all I've done for you. Look what all I've done for you. I've done and I've done and I've given and I've given and I've graced and I've graced. And all I ever asked was you just to give me your best. That's all. He didn't ask you to tie $10,000. Though if he did, write the check this morning and put it in our plate out there, please. He, he didn't ask you to go to the back of Africa. If he does, you need to obey. He's not asking you to stand and sing a song or try to pick up a guitar that you've never touched and play it for him. He's not asked for that. He's not asked you to serve him and be on watch for him standing at the door of this church 24-7. No, maybe in prayer and in dedication to him, yes. But all he's asked is this. Just give me your best. If I can give my best on the football field, then surely I can give my best to God. And if I have to compromise between football and the Lord, then I think I'll cheat football. And I'll just give God my best. If I have to compromise on my hunting or my fishing, because that's my hobbies, I don't golf, that would bring out the flesh in me, I'm sure. If I had to compromise on, on hunting and fishing or whatever my activities are, if I had to compromise on that or compromise on giving God my best, I think I'll just cheat hunting and fishing. I got up one day and went fishing with a friend of mine, and 
I don't know why, but I, did, I just knew that day when I got up, I wasn't supposed to go. I even felt it the night before. I, no reason that I knew of. I, I was going to the lake and my one day a week to go to the lake. And so I was hooking up and going and sure all morning that morning, I felt like I should not be there. I should not be there. And we got there, had boat trouble, motor trouble, run way up the lake, got in a terrible storm like that killed us. Uh, and, and it just, I knew I wasn't supposed to be there. And I told my buddy, I said, man, I said, I'm going to tell you something. I said, I wasn't supposed to be here today. I said, I was afraid of what you'd think if I called you and told you I didn't feel like I was supposed to go fishing. You know, I had to be faithful to fishing. And I said, I, I just wasn't supposed to be here. And he'd helped me through all these troubles, been through the storm with me. He said, man, do me a favor next time. Next time you feel led to not go fishing, please count me out. He said, I don't want to go and be with you when that happens. If I'm going to compromise on something, I have to choose between those kind of things and the Lord. Well, I need to compromise on that, on the fishing, the hunting, the pleasures, the recreation, all of the activities. And the bottom line is this, I need to quit coming up with excuses because God wants my best. And when it comes to giving him my best, I have no excuse. There's no excuse. And so this morning while you sit right there and I stand right here, we, I can't say, well, you know, if only this, then I could have given God my best or only that, I could have given God my best. Well, if it had worked out this way, then I'd give God my best. Uh, maybe if, uh, you know, if peak of the rut was another time. Uh, maybe if the football schedule had been different. Uh, maybe, you know, if whatever. Maybe if the mall stayed open later. Uh, let me say this. Maybe if the shoe store had stayed open later. You with me, ladies? Maybe then I could have given God my... No. No, see, there's no excuse that will stand. When it comes giving God our best. Some of them may say, why don't you give God $10,000? And I might be able to say, because I lost my job two weeks ago. I'm just trying to make ends meet. Ends meet. Somebody may say, why don't you go to Africa and be a missionary? And maybe I can say, because of my health. I've got a chronic illness that won't let me go to the back of Africa. And so I may have excuses for everything else. But when the Lord looks and wants the best out of me, I, I have no excuse. No excuse. And so the Bible says he's invested. He's invested. He's invested. He's given you every single thing you need to bring him your best. And then we see God's disappointment. God says, I watched. I watched and I waited and I watched and I waited. I watched and I waited. And not only did you not bring forth the best, but you just brought forth fruit that really wasn't any good at all. How come it is on all these other things we give our best? I mean, we're going to do it. And I've always been that way. If I, if I something takes an interest, if I take an interest in something, man, I'm Googling it, I'm YouTubing it, I'm talking to people because like, I want to know all this, know about it, and when I do it, I'm going to do it right about everything. Why is it we're like that? Why are we going to pledge allegiance to the world and all of its activities? And then we stroll in here and we give God our leftovers. Why is that? We, we, we give our best to things that won't matter in eternity. But when it comes to the Lord, we're okay with just giving God mm, what's good or mediocre. We might be okay with it, but God's not. I just want to ask you this question. I want to ask you the question for those watching on Liberty Live. Because I want to say this, and you folks know I love you. And I've never stood. I'm as Isaiah in Isaiah 6. I've never stood and just pointed a finger at you. The finger points at me first. So I just want to ask you right here, right now. And for those watching on Liberty Live, are you, are you giving God your best? Because here's the thing. If we're giving God our best... Liberty Baptist Church would be full this morning if we'd given God our best. And so this morning, for those of you sitting here, is going to respond in just a moment to this invitation. Has God got your best? That's all He wants. It's not too much to ask for because He's invested in you. He's blessed you. And the problem is, what happened to America? I said this morning, Bradley, that my mom and dad's generation dropped a ball. But that, I, I come up the road, the Lord changed my thoughts on that. 
is, uh, I felt like my, my mom and dad's generation, the Woodstock generation, the hippie generation. Yeah, some of you were there. Some of you guys had long hippie hair and bell-bottom pants that you wore. I ain't going to go there this morning. But I, I actually believe it was my grandparents' generation because here's what happened. God brought them through a world war, World War II, a world war. This nation prayed as no nation had ever prayed before. England prayed as no nation had ever prayed before. In fact, prayed heaven down upon earth. God brought the victory. And then God, in response to the prayers of a nation, God began to prosper America. And God prospered us unlike any time in our history through those years following World War II. And then what happened along the way is, is we stopped worshiping the blesser and we started worshiping the blessing. And that's when trouble entered in. And that's when a generation was born and raised that become the hippie generation, the Woodstock generation. Friend, listen to me just for a moment. My fear is, is that we worship God's blessings and give no thought to the blesser who's given us those blessings, from whom all blessings flow. And so this morning, where do you stand? Are you giving God your best? Because we can change it today. And today, you can put down anchor. And you can say, right here, I stop giving God what's just good. Right here is where I stop giving God what's left over. And right here is where I give God my best. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I want to ask you to stand. I'm going to ask you here to make your way to this altar right now. And while people are making their way to this altar, I'm asking you on Liberty Live just to bow your head and bend your knees where you're at. And you give God your best this morning in every way. Girls, sing.